Tonight we are talking with Tara Nuren and Tia Edmondson Morton. Uh, if you have not read it yet, uh, Tara has a new book out, A Woman's Place is in the Brew House. Uh, as an NAGBW member, if you have not yet bought the book, uh, we will reimburse you 50% of the purchase price. So if you want to buy the book after tonight's conversation, feel free to send an email to myself. Details will be on reportersnotebook.org about how you can do that. Um, Tara and Tia, uh, two very accomplished people joining us tonight. Uh, Tara, you might recognize her words from Forbes.com. Also educator, uh, certified beer judge marketing consultant, and with Tia. She's an archivist at Oregon State University, uh, and we will also learn about a new exciting book project that Tia is working on as well. Um, a great uh, collection of knowledge between Tara and Tia about the world of beer and women's place in it. So um, we are focusing uh, first tonight on Tara's book, uh, Women's Place in the Brew House. This is the tagline, which explores women's fundamental yet forgotten role in brewing throughout history and reveals the political, economic, and religious forces that have edged them out of the industry every time it became profitable. Uh, that's a great sales pitch, if, if there ever was one, to tease the curiosity. Uh, and that's why we're going to start talking tonight uh, with Tara. Thank you so much for being here and sharing this. Really appreciate it. We do, you're, we do have you on mute. mute. <laughs> Here we are. I said, thank you, Brian. Your support of the book has been amazing. Hi, everyone. Nice to see everybody. I'm excited to be here. Um, I So the way we're going to do things tonight, Tara and I are going to chat for about 15 minutes, and then Tara and Tia are going to take it over before we open it up to questions from the group. So if you have something you want to ask about, feel free to save it. You can do it to me as a direct message, or you can post it in the chat box. We'll make sure that we can have those questions asked uh, tonight. Um, Tara, uh, when you envision a project like this and to create a book like this, what is it that leads you to begin this project? What were the origins that made you want to put your time and effort toward it? Um, well, I joke that, um, it's, I joke, but it's actually the truth. I didn't have this grand notion of writing a book, writing the great American novel. It actually was the idea of Terry Farendorf, who founded the Pink Boots Society. Um, we were on the phone a couple years ago and she said to me, Tara, no one's written a book about the history of women in beer and you need to write it. And Terry had given me grand ideas before that were like thrilling and intimidating that I never pursued. And um, this time when she said that, I thought, oh, you know, I think I could probably actually do that. And then when she said, you're the one who needs to write it, I thought, okay, well, it doesn't exist yet. I better get to it before somebody else <laughs> scoops me, basically. And uh, it took a couple of years um, of working on the proposal, but then I was lucky to get a publisher pretty quickly. And um, here we are. It was released about three weeks ago. For those who have not written a book before, can you give context for what it means to have this act as a project for you? Hmm. You mean as far as what I what like what doors I think it might open or or what? Well, I guess first and foremost, perhaps simply the the undertaking of what it means to write a book that requires a lot of research on top of the writing and crafting it into uh, the full book. Yeah, I mean, it was super scary. The very first thing I did was buy a book about how to write a book. Um, and I, I learned that some of it was true and some of it was very much not true, but the process of writing the proposal, I found to be pretty grueling, to be honest, because um, the book that I read said that every proposal should contain one sample chapter. And I know there are publishers who ask for three to four sample chapters and I can't even imagine, but it's sort of like, writing this huge investigative article on spec before you sell it like that's putting in so much work right before you know if anybody wants it what they're going to want um so that was pretty daunting and time consuming and scary and then um once I got the contract I had um originally I had about 
13 months between signing the contract and um, the submission deadline. Um, it ended up taking a couple months longer. Um, I blamed COVID <laughs> for needing some extra time. I learned to my great relief that basically no writer, every writer asks for an extension. So that made me feel better. Um, I was terrified of my editor for the entire time, <laughs> even though she's the nicest person on earth. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and you know, I have other jobs, you know, I'm a freelancer. Most of us have other jobs. So you've got to be writing this book in addition to doing all the stuff you normally do. Um, I mean, I say, luckily it's sort of a bittersweet way to look at it, but COVID happened, um, you know, kind of in the middle of the process. So at least I couldn't travel for work, which was not great for the book, but good for my ability to spend more time just focusing on the book. Hmm. Um, yeah. Well, what you said, you said the first thing you did was you bought a book about writing a book. What was that book? Uh, it's in the basement. I don't remember the exact name, but, um, this, it was a woman, I think it was literally called how to publish a book. Mm -hmm. Um, and later on, if we're doing Q and A, if you guys want me to run downstairs and grab it, I will. Like I said, I found it to be a good, um, starting point to teach me that the publishing industry isn't like I think we all at one point think it it, it was it's not like that anymore you know you're not getting these huge advances um, you might have to hire your own illustrators your own editors your own publicists luckily my publisher does supply a lot of that um, but it prepared me for having to do a lot more of the work on my own than I had originally thought what would you and you also said that some of the things you read were true and weren't true maybe for those who haven't uh, again maybe those who haven't written a book or are curious what is it what did that mean like what were some of the things that you found me that weren't true in that book but were true in your experience that maybe helped you along the way um I think the book was maybe more absolute than reality. Um, the book had me convinced that I absolutely would need to hire all of these ancillary people on my own and that I would have to hit the pavement myself, knocking on all the doors of all the Barnes and Nobles and all the indie bookstores because I was a first time author. No one knows me. Um, now, again, I, I feel like I got a publisher who does more handholding than maybe most for first time authors. Um, but I have an in-house publicist who is, you know, getting the word out. I don't have to pay her. I had a team of editors I didn't have to pay. I didn't have to hire my own illustrators. So um, it was actually a pleasant surprise to find out that I prepared myself for a much more draconian reality than I actually experienced. What other publishers do or don't, I, I can't say for sure, but um, I know it's not as absolute as the book made it sound. And I know a lot of us are familiar with the time and effort that it takes to write a news story or a feature where you're interviewing sources and maybe you're doing some background research as well. But could you give a sense of what it takes in terms of research beyond just the writing to learn all the things that you needed to learn to put this book together? Um, yeah, that's... I don't really know where to start with that answer because there's so it's so big. Um, so my from my own experience, things changed dramatically once the pandemic hit. Um, I was doing a lot of traveling, um, so when I would go on a press trip, for instance, um, I'd make sure to carve some time or stay a few extra days so that I could get to the National Library of Scotland, for instance, um, try to interview the experts working in that country, et cetera. Um, you know, once the pandemic hit, like I said, I couldn't go anywhere. So then it really became much more about emailing people, um, phone conversations. I hate the phone, so that wasn't fun for me, but it's part of it. Um, and to be really honest with you all, it would it ended up being a lot more internet research than I had anticipated because I didn't really have access to that many books anymore, right? Because 
you know, there are these like books in Finland written in Finnish about Finnish folklore and drinking that I couldn't access from home, right? So I did really have to rely a lot. And I hate to say this, but it is the truth. Like I had to rely a lot more on internet magazine articles and such than I had wanted to. Now, I spent a lot of time making sure I was only relying on information from sources and writers I trust. Um, but we all know how hard it is sometimes to sift through the good and bad information on the internet. Um, and even sources we trust can make mistakes. Even, you know, magazines that are supposed to be trustworthy put out bad information. So um, that part was pretty dicey. Um, and I still hold my breath sometimes, um, you know, hoping that nobody calls to my attention some glaring error or something. But again, like that's also untold part of the process. Um, I freaked out because I found out that there like are a couple of things, small things that need to be changed. And um, my editor reassured me and said that the joy of cooking took many, many, many revisions to get right. <laughs> so I'm trying to look at it that way instead of like, a magazine like a, a print journalist where you know one error and you just want to stick a knife in your temple um and there was one other thing that I do want to mention and I don't know if this would be relevant to anybody going forward writing a book but one of the things I lost access to when the pandemic hit was museum and academic research because not only was I grounded at home but people couldn't go into their office Offices. So if I reached out to a professor or, or, you know, a museum curator, I got a lot of, I'd love to help you, Tara, but I haven't been in my office in five months. So sorry. So, you know, that was, that was kind of limiting too. And it really did shape the way the book turned out, what information I focused on and what information I didn't include at all in some cases. Yeah. You know, what, what was it like, I guess, uh, learning all of these new things because it's not just you know trying to focus on specific things that you thought or anticipated being the book but like any amount of good reporting you're going to be picking up new things all the time that are going to change the way that you're thinking about things and potentially writing it too what was that experience like for you it was really thrilling if I'm understanding your question right and cut me off if I'm not um Every time I found, like, I had this narrative in my head. I mean, I've been covering women in beer for 16 years, so I picked up a little knowledge along the way. Um, and because of archival silences, which we'll talk about in a couple minutes with Tia, I was learning, in for, I, was, I, I kept learning about women I didn't know existed, like early pioneering women, you know, so you know, there's one female brewer who touts herself as the, the first female brewery owner since Prohibition. And frankly, that's not true um, because I found a whole bunch more who came before her doing various things, but nobody knew about them. Um, so every time I sort of discovered somebody new, um, it was really exciting. And I spent a lot of time, I'm really interested in early craft beer history. So I tried for a while to write like the definitive timeline of all the breweries that opened, you know, before 1985 or something. And um, that was really hard also because when you're covering something like that, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with this, do you look at what day they filed their paperwork? what day they opened their doors to the public, what day they sold their first beer, you know, like the first brew, like how do you really write a timeline when there's so many different ways that you could define opening um, and the records aren't necessarily all that available or accurate either because we're talking about, like I say, I'm a writer, I don't math, however many decades ago that was. <laughs> Of, of all of the things in, uh, that you got to learn through the experience of research and writing this book, I, I don't want to hold you to like the one grand thing that maybe surprised you or you felt most excited about, but maybe are, are there a couple of things when you were preparing and researching and then writing 
that as you learned just felt really new and fun and exciting for you? As far as, are you thinking about process or content or either one? I'm thinking, well, perhaps both really. Okay. Um, well, this wasn't a fun discovery, but it was my biggest surprise as far as content goes. Um, I have a chapter about um, brewing in Northern Europe in the Iron Age, and there were certain villages where men were doing the brewing, not the women. And in some of those places, women weren't allowed to be where the men were because the men believed that the presence of women would spoil the beer. You know, not just that they were bad brewers or there were a lot of contaminants around. Um, and then I interviewed this woman who's in her 80s, Jerry, who has been like a brewer and a lab, well, more of a lab person um, throughout the decades. And in the 60s, she worked in a lab, I believe it was Hams at the time, but that brewery changed ownership a couple of times. So it might've been owned by somebody else. I don't want to throw Hams down, <laughs> down the river, but um, the lab was staffed by all women and they weren't allowed to get their own samples from the floor because the men believed that the women's yeast <laughs> would contaminate the beer. So that was my biggest surprise as far as content goes that the more things stay the same, the more they stay the same when it comes to process goes. Um, Huh, that's a great question. I don't think anybody's asked me. Um, um, ask me the next question. I don't want to waste anybody's time thinking about it. Well, that, we'll, we'll hold that one maybe toward the end because I do want to to bring over uh, Tia Edmondson Morton, um, who gets to add another layer to this conversation. Uh, Tia, thank you very much for being a part of this and joining it. Um, Tara, uh, I would love to be able to, to hand the mic over to you. Uh, so maybe you and Tia can talk a little bit about all the things that you know, you've learned, you continue to explore. Um, and so I'll, I'll kit, let you kick it off and then uh, we'll jump back in in just a bit. Uh, sure. Well, hi, Tia. Hi, Tia. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Would you, Tia was like my guru <laughs> when it came to the process of research and you know what to expect when researching women in beer would you just in case people don't know who you are you've got like 10 titles who are you <laughs> tell us titles. who you are <laughs> uh so i'm an archivist um and i started the oregon hops and brewing archives in 2013 and i was actually just reconstructing this i've been obsessed with women in brewing since 2015 so it was <laughs> I hadn't, I hadn't been running an archive very long before I started wanting to fill it with stories of people who were not the, um, at least in Oregon, it's been very male dominated for a long time. Um, and I was trying to remember Tara when we even met each other <laughs> um, and like how we started talking about archival silence um, and the, the things that aren't in record, that aren't in these boxes, that um, this is the, one of the collections, the last collections I processed for the Portland Brewing Company. Um, but I'm trying to remember how we met. I know that it was in the process of researching this book, because I thought, oh, I've just found this wonderful woman, and you've already been, do you'd already been doing this for a couple of years, so I felt kind of stupid, <laughs> um, and I don't remember what the exact, you know, how or why I found you, but, um, you know, your work informed my work a lot and you know we're talking content versus process but when we con when it comes to content you've got this incredible um oral archive of oral histories mm -hmm. of men also but a lot of women yeah. who have worked in the or in the pacific northwest brewing scene um and so i know that was super helpful how did you come to start that project it's funny because um, I was, um, I, so I realized pretty quickly that craft beer is not a, uh, an industry that 
would be done. And so archivists usually <laughs> um, in the in the, the past times, not just like the before COVID times, but like the past times, archivists waited for people to be done with their stuff. And there wasn't a whole lot of active collecting and oral historians or historians um, or archaeologists or anthropologists, those are all very separate fields. And so it was the historians who interpreted it, it was the oral historians who, you know, did interviews with people, it was the archivists who put stuff in boxes. And, and we waited until things were done. And so when I started the archive, I knew that that like that wasn't going to be a way to do it, because then I would never have any collections. And so I started talking to people and I thought I should record these histories. And the first, one of the first people I talked to was Carl Okert, who was the first brewer at Bridgeport um, in Portland. And I said, who should I talk to? And he said, you should talk to my wife. And so the first person I interviewed was his wife. Um, it was delightful. He like brought groceries home at the end, you know, and she's like, shh, I'm being interviewed. Um, and then I interviewed him like two or two or three years later. And he said, well, I didn't mean like never interview me. <laughs> um, but that really framed how I thought about the archive I run and that that to have somebody from the very beginning say, you know, these are the stories that are told and these are the people who aren't talked to. And so if you want to actually build something that's interesting, you need to look at who hasn't been talked to. So that was that was why I started doing oral histories. I also love to talk a lot and I was really surprised by how much I love to listen and getting people's stories are just, it's such a, it's, it's cheesy, but it's a really magical gift. Like people give you the gift of their stories and it, it's, um, yeah, it's one of my favorite parts of my job. Um, there are just so, so, so many interviews and I want to, um, transition to talking specifically now about what are archival silences and, and how we can, you and, and journalists can get around them and, and understand them in our research. Um, I hope you all don't mind. I want to read a couple quick, hopefully, paragraphs from my intro where I think it just sort of explains very quickly what we're talking about when we say archival silences, and I quote Tia, uh, as I do often throughout the book. Um, and I do also want to say, I just thought of what my favorite, I think, part of the book is, um, which also has to do with archival silences, which is that um, you'll find that the son of a woman named um, in Cartwright, it was called, and it closed after like a year. And um, I interviewed their son because they're they're not living anymore. And at the end, he said, thank you. And then when I developed a friendship with Amy Finkel, who's the, the daughter, the grown daughter of Charles and Roseanne Finkel, who started Pike Brewing, in Seattle, she said the same exact thing. And it just makes me cry when I think of it. She said, like all these years later, and, and Roseanne just passed away like a year and a half ago. And she said, thank you for asking about mom. Everyone always asks about my dad. Um, and so that's a really kind of poignant example of our kind of case of these two women, you know, they were everybody that's involved in the starting and running the breweries as their husbands, but their husband were the ones anybody ever talks about. And that's still true with Charles, bless his heart. I mean, everybody just talks about Charles, even though he always gives Roseanne a lot of credit. So anyway, let me just read these couple paragraphs real quick. Um, okay. With men conventionally dismissing women's lives as unimportant or not interesting enough to examine, our real-time histories haven't been written down. Scant evidence of women does exist, as in legal documents or newspapers, we usually have to rely on the male record for wisps of information, which come bound up in the male perspective. Lamentably, the same can be said for the stories of African Americans and other marginalized or underrepresented populations. Don't believe me? Here's Tia Edmondson Morton again. Quote, archives and records repositories are spaces that reflect power and document the dominant narrative. Decisions are made by creators, by archivists, and by researchers about what to include and who to exclude. The result can be distortion, omission, and erasure. And so, for all the voices recorded in an archive, there are also many that have been silenced." End quote. 
As anyone who has done historical research on women knows, their stories weren't actually hidden. More often, they were simply not recorded. The history of women's work is often told through the story of husbands and sons. They were categorized as wives and mothers rather than business partners or owners. A, a, I think a decent definition of what we're talking about. You've, you're having this love affair with this woman right now <laughs> who lived about, about 150 years ago or so. Um, you're a lot with, you know, in researching her and other women from the 19th century who were involved in the beer industry somehow in Oregon. Um, tell us, tell us like what you do and don't find and, and what's frustrating and how you get around it. Yeah. So I've, I've been an archivist for a long time. Um, and by a long time, I mean, 16 years, six, I've been at OSU for 15 years. Um, and I have been an archival educator almost the whole time I've been an archivist. So I have taught a lot of students how to do research and I've matched a lot of people up with sources. And I think probably the best thing and most humbling thing that I've done is become a researcher myself um, because I'm not saying I didn't know how to do research, but I really didn't understand what that meant. <laughs> um, and so I, I started really just, I, I got, I got hooked on these ladies. There are just these certain people that I just, I just wanted to know more about. Um, and I, um, what I think I didn't understand is that I couldn't just search historical newspapers for Frederica Vetter is one of the women that I am writing about, or um, Louisa Weinhardt is somebody that I published an article about, um, wife of Henry Weinhardt. Um, and I think I didn't, what was shocking to me immediately was that women didn't have their own names. Um, and so I think that was like the thing that the, the like thing I had to reconcile with um, is that I had to do this research through their husbands and sons and that just didn't feel right and I really like I like I fought against that um, and I fight against it every time I do a search for Mrs. blah blah um, which ironically in Oregon's historic newspapers also gets all the Mr. blah blah so I'm like well that's great that's not even narrowing it down um so I think what I what I realized is that in order to do this work, I had to get really good at Ancestry, which I'm not great at Ancestry.com. I'm getting better at it. I read the census. Like, actually, I read the census. Um, I've read the 1850, 1860, 1870, and I'm, all, I'm halfway through the 1880 census because that's how you find people. Um, so I think the, the thing that really has stood out to me is um, how tedious and not brief it is. Like it's really, really tedious research to do. Um, and I'm writing this book, um, which is uh, about um, women who were married to brewers. They, for the most part, were not brewers um, and people want them to be brewers and they just weren't. <laughs> um, and something that really struck me, Tara, in reading your book was, this idea of like these people weren't hidden. Like it, it wasn't, it wasn't even that like these were people who were unidentified in many cases. It's that nobody turned their head to look at them. I mean, that's that's what I kept thinking over and over again in your book was like, you just had to go like this, and then there was somebody else there. And so I think the um I, I it's like to state the obvious, um the people who had their records kept were kept for all of the dominant narrative reasons that we know um, records were kept. And so you really, really have to look in places where um, people in some case were in crisis. Divorce records are some of my favorite things right now. Um, one of the women who I am researching got divorced. It was a horrible, horrible, nasty divorce. And that's the only place I found any of her own words um, is in her divorce record. There are also these places like historical newspapers that can be really, really mundane. Um, and so you get this idea of the life that someone led because they went to visit their sister or they, um, had they grew roses or they submitted some cake to a fair um, and that's where you really start to get the texture and so I think that the challenging thing about the silence in archives is that means that you you have to look other places um, 
And sometimes it's just not there. Like sometimes the the records of those people just simply aren't there. And that I think in addition to having to research women through men, I think that understanding of absence, um, that's hard for me. Um, there's something that you and I have both touched on in the past few minutes that I always emphasize when I'm explaining this is it just wasn't, women's work wasn't considered important or interesting. And I have had similar conversations with, with Dr. J about say slave, uh, enslaved people, for instance, um, you know, there was a whole life happening on, on plantations that just didn't get documented because it wasn't considered important or interesting. So, um, you know, people researching all kinds of underrepresented people who aren't the dominant population encounter the same problems. Mm -hmm. um, and I, one of the things that I have run up against and been super frustrated about with women is um, you're talking about their, their first names aren't recorded. And I don't think you said this. I apologize if I'm repeating what you said, but obituaries even, um, <laughs> you know, and even there, I have this um, chapter about temperance or about prohibition. And I focus a lot on this one very sad, influential New York socialite named Pauline Sabin and she did crazy things for a woman at the time and she led the volunteer effort of the Red Cross and when she passed away oh and then um when you google her and I think they took it down but when I was doing research and I googled her I saw the um website the PBS website for the Ken Burns documentary series Prohibition and and um they said that they gave her some sort of obituary and they didn't even use her first name. And that was last year. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it doesn't, these are things, the fact that there are more women and more people of color um, and people who aren't part of the dominant population getting involved in research and writing means that um, you know, there are more people who are going to work harder, I think, to find, you know, I'm Jewish, for instance, like if that were my area of interest, I would work hard to uncover Jews who might not have been um, covered enough. You get my point. Um, yeah. But I, I think I have hope. I'm optimistic. Are you? Yeah. And, and I think the, the thing that also I tell students. Yeah. Did I freeze? Did you freeze? I can see you now. Can people hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, I tell students who are in a 10 week term who have to write a research paper, you have to write about something you care about. Like you think about where you're from, think about um, something that you're interested in, think about a sport that you like, think about like a color you like, you know, like that, that like, do you like pale beer? Do you like light, you know, dark beer? Like get something that you want to know more about because it's, it, it can, you can write the, like, um, the most boring paper on IPA ever. If you don't want to know anything about IPA, lots of students want to write papers on IPA. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think that the, for me, it definitely is like, I don't want to stop researching this. And so I, I think I, I tell students that too, that it, it like write about what you actually really want to know more about. And I mean, that's certainly something that's, um, as, as people who are actually write for a living, obviously you can't only write about stuff you want to write about <laughs> recognizing that. Um, yeah, I think diversity of interest and diversity of research focus is really important. I would write a paper and, and Tara, you would write a paper and they could be about the same thing and they would be different because we've lived different lives and different things stand out to us. So, um, yeah, it's, I, I think I like it. <laughs> Tia, Tia, I would love to maybe, um, give a base level explainer, both for myself and others. So I'm going to, I'm going to show really quickly, 
um, the link that you had shared. Uh, this is the Oregon Hops and Brewing Archives. This is, of course, a place where we can go to find a host of historical documents and context, and people can see right here on the tabs the things that you might be able to find. But for those of us who maybe aren't used to doing historical digging, um, how should we think about these things and where should we go? Maybe just if we want to look up, you know, some newspaper archives from 1927, or if we want to have a chance to better understand, you know, a piece of history that we have to go searching for that, you know, maybe like JSTOR or something isn't mm -hmm. going to help out on. How do we do that? Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that is, that's a great question. And that's what I, I, um, I always tell people full disclosure. First place I start is Google full disclosure. Second place I go is often Wikipedia and it's never the place that you end, but that kind of historical context, like sometimes you can just get enough and then you become more efficient at your research. Um, the Library of Congress has been doing this amazing digitization project. Um, it's uh, the, the whole site is called Chronicling America, and it's a digitization of newspapers. Uh, and copyright, I think, goes through 26 or 27 right now. Um, don't do not quote me on that. So um, it, things are out of copyright after 70 something years. Um, so there are, depending on your time period, the pre-prohibition stuff and most of prohibition is all in that. So that's, that's super helpful for people who are doing American research. Each state will also usually have a digitized newspaper project um, and some of them are better than others. Um, there are, I think once you get to a certain level, um, the challenge for people who aren't associated with universities is that you don't have access to the databases that we have access to. And I think to me that that's broken. <laughs> um, and, and I think it's broken for people who want to do deeper research. I think it's broken for people who learn how, you know, we teach people how to do this research and then they leave the university and then they don't have access to databases anymore. So JSTOR is a great example. I think a lot of JSTOR's content is online. So I think there, there are um, databases of articles that are available to people. Um, I use Google Scholar a lot. And I think um, that's something that I kind of interchange our own, my library databases um, and Google Scholar. I've been working a lot um, since the winter of 2020, there was the first beer history class at OSU was taught. And then um, we taught, we co I, I help out with the class as a librarian. Um, and we taught all of the rest of the sessions on the internet computer from right here. <laughs> um, in fact, from my bedroom. Um, and we've gone back to teaching in person now, um, and that's been great, but there was so much that was available to the students online, it was great. What I put in the, the chat was a link to this guide that I made to support that beer history class. Um, it's a beer research guide. Oh yeah, there it is. Um, and uh, I, I think the, um, the thing that I tried to do was link out to public stuff if I could. Um, but to give, give people an idea of the different sources um, that are available, there are a lot. Um, there are also not that many. And I think that's the thing that I talk to students about a lot. Tara, what you were saying about, um, depending on the history that you do, um, you have to be creative in the sources that you use. And so it it's not at all surprising to me that you had to do most of your research on, um, on more popular publications. And I think we teach students, like look for these things because these bound things are what you look for. And this is, this is, a, this is a source and this is a good source. It is a good source because I read it, but, um, but it doesn't mean that there aren't other sources that are good sources too. That was a very, very long answer to your question. <laughs> and and it, it, a great one. So thank you for the depth and context there. And I, I, I actually, I wrote down the thing that you said first. I want to repeat it for everybody too, because this also describes great reporting. As you said, you may start it out at Google, uh, but it's never the place that you end uh, and I just want to put like a giant exclamation point on that um, because it's, you know, we'll always start somewhere 
but the natural process of, cu process of curiosity is going to lead us to ask new questions and hopefully change what we were thinking about to begin with. So we can, we can better understand and better report and better cover these things. Um, Tara, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you a question right after I ask this one of Tia, because I, these two things are kind of hanging in my mind as maybe clearly evident, but not spoken out loud for the 40 minutes we've been talking. Tia, um, you've given great context for your passion and love for this kind of stuff. Why does history matter? Well, why does history matter? I mean, I, I think I'm not going to give the like, if we don't know history, it will repeat itself answer. Like, I won't, I won't do that. Um, because I think we will anyway, even if we don't know it. I just think it's really important to know about the lives of the people who lived before us. And I think to me, that's what sort of grounds us in humanness. Um, and I think um, it's, it's just, that's very important to me. I think we, people lived before us and had experiences that we can learn from whether those are um, ones we want to emulate or ones that we do not at all. Um, I just, I think it's, I think it's respectful um, of the people who lived before us. That's what I think about when I am writing about these women that um, what would they think about this? Like, would they, would they be excited that I was writing about them? Um, would they think I was really weird? Cause I have pictures of them <laughs> like up, like they're my ancestors. Um, but I just, I think that connection is really important. And, and so, you know, Tara, I think the process that you went through to reveal so much about things that we don't know about or didn't know about plays such a key important role in the things that Tia is just talking about. So when you think about writing this book and the act of trying to reveal things that were either silenced forgotten, just never shared or reported on. Why is having a book like this so important? Well, context um, is a simple sort of flip answer, but I, I think about this a lot, that it's a complete coincidence that the book came out now in fall of 2021, six months or so after May of 2021, when, you know, the, the sexism in the industry finally blew open in the public. Um, and a lot of people ask me, how did we get here? Um, you know, why are all these problems happening? And it's 200,000 years old. Um, and so, think that it helps us understand our own contemporary worlds better. Um, you know, I also tell people that there's a lot they can get out of this book, even if they don't drink beer at all, because it explains, I mean, I'm not going to pretend that it explains everything. It's less than 300 pages, but, you know, it endeavors to explain the evolution of misogyny and the patriarchy throughout human history. And we're still obviously, you know, really struggling with that now. Um, and so, yeah, I think we're going to repeat the past, whether we know the past or not also. Um, but at least it can help us make some better sense of it. Did that answer your question? It does. And it actually leads in really great with a question uh, that Pete had sent in that he would love to hear from you, Tara. Um, Pete, he, he prefaces, he says, the book, de book description states how men grew greedy about profiting from brewing once women demonstrated that it could be economically viable and profitable. Uh, can you share how the gender role of women was reassigned to childbearing, child raising, cooking, and running the household while men assumed the brewer or brewery owner role as the breadwinner and face of the business? Sure. Um, that's a great question, Pete. I will um, clarify before I start that I would not use the word reassigned to because women have always had to do all of those things. They just brewed in addition to them. Um, you know, as a lot of people on the call probably know, um, Every civilization that 
I know of that has had fear as part of it, um, has really relied on it as a base for its nutrition, including babies. And because of that, brewing has been a household chore. And so when it's a household chore, the women do it. Um, you know, when they can make a tiny pennies, I think I said earlier, um, or maybe that was in the interview I did right before this, <laughs> I can't keep it straight anymore. Um, so, you know, when it's a household chore, no glory, no recognition, the women do it. Um, but right, when, when um, profit comes into the equation um, or religion starts to want to suppress people who are outspoken or politics does the same thing. Maybe the king wants to assert more power. They subjugate the people who are the most vulnerable. Um, I believe the contemporary expression is shit rolls downhill. Um, and uh, so that's what has happened over and over and over and over in history. It, it's staggering because it's, throughout time and throughout space, the same thing has happened. So what I say, kind of my elevator catch for pitch is that women have been the original brewers in pretty much every civilization throughout human history, even pre-civilization. Um, but when you've got the forces of economics, politics, and or religion, um, men come in and take over. Um, and sometimes that's like scientific discovery. Um, and and I've learned that the word progress is usually a bad thing for women historically um, because at least throughout most of time, progress probably means like more capital investment, more equipment, um, more like bigger, better, more professional and women don't generally or haven't historically have, act, have had access. Women have historically not have act, had access to those things. Um, I want to uh, highlight maybe one last thing and ask this of you, Tara, as we maybe start to, to wrap up a bit that I think the collaboration that you've kind of mentioned and talked with Tia about tonight has been so important for the research and work and inspiration that you found for what you did here. Um, and of course, you know, we have a growing yet small collection of beer focused history that we have access to. Could you give a sense for, for others, just the value of being able to have uh, a, a TIA uh, and people like TIA as resources in terms of ways that it can help us do our jobs better? I, I mean, I can't overstate the how critical TIA was to my research. Um, you know, she has, she sent me articles about archival silences, for instance. She sent me articles about these women she's writing a book about. Um, and she always did it immediately. I don't mean to like promise everybody that she's gonna be able to get to so quickly, but at least last year she could. Um, but then you look at somebody also like Teresa McCullough, who's um, the Smithsonian, your curator and um, I believe very strongly that she's she focuses so much of her attention on making sure she's getting women's stories because she is a woman that's not to say a man wouldn't also really want to represent women well but it's more of a crapshoot you bring a female historian in and they're going to be trained and aware of these types of issues that we're talking about and really go out of their way to um, make sure those stories are represented those people are represented those stories are told to the best of their ability um, there was one other person I wanted to mention and I, I'm blanking on them now but um yeah, it's just, it's the people who are specializing in a particular area of research who are going to have more information available than somebody who's like a generalist trying to span 200,000 years of history. Um, so they're fantastic people to um, kind of reach out to and say, what do you have? And somebody said something about posting questions on Twitter. I did get a lot of articles sent to me um, via 
beer historians on Twitter, um, stuff that like I didn't, had not come across before at all that was super helpful. Um, so yeah, the, don't overlook, this is obvious, but like don't overlook the people who have written specific books about, you know, women in Oregon beer history or, you know, brewers in Colorado history is another one, et cetera. Yeah, and I'm gonna, uh, in the chat box, I just put in the website that Tia has shared as well as she has her email on that website. Um, I always like to highlight the fact that when we can and we have access to these kinds of experts and resources, uh, please, please do in the way that it sounds like it has helped Tara, uh, it can certainly help you too. Um, I'm going to do a quick little plug real quick. Uh, again, uh, Tia, I think you hinted at this book and you shared the link in the chat box as well about the, this book that you're working on, focusing on uh, beer women in Oregon. Um, real quick, uh, as we start to wrap up too, uh, you know, similar to what I asked Tara, when you think about the importance and what it was that drove you to work on this book, why is it that that book uh, that you're working on is so important to focus on uh, 19th century women in beer in your state? You know, I don't really know yet. Um, and I, I think the, um, I also had to go through the grueling book publishing con or not the contract, the proposal process. Um, and the book that I proposed, I, now I'm like, oh, I actually write that. Um, but I, I think the thing that I feel like I'm learning. So I'm from Oregon. My family's been in Oregon for a long time. Um, and I didn't know a lot about Oregon. Um, and I think that the thing that has really stood out to me is um, that I wanted these women to be brewers um, and that I wanted there to be like a shared characteristic that they had. I wanted there to be something that like brought them all together in a nice little tidy, like, this is the thing, this is the, this, this is what ties these people together. And I guess beer does that. Um, but they're all such incredible, like unique individuals. Um, and I think, I, I think the thing that has stood out to me more is that there are people who are really interesting to me. And then there are people who, uh, are not, and I'm like, I'm really struggling right now with like, like, how do I write about the mundane people? Um, because those were also the important people. So there are like the super dramatic stories about people getting divorced. Um, and those give me lots of content, but there are also people who just lived, I mean, not conflict free life, um, but that they just live their lives. And so how, like that sometimes that feels a little boring to me. Um, and that's, and that's, that's kind of what I'm struggling with. <laughs> um is how to how, like how many people to feature and do I if I if I feature all the ones who seem really like a uh, national inquirer kind of people then that gives a really like poor version of what brewers in Oregon in 1860 were like um and and how how do you put the the kind of uh guardrails on that because I can't write about every industry in Oregon and I can't write about everything in Oregon so that's that's I that's what I don't know what my book is about I'll be honest if, <laughs> I worry uh, about it a little bit <laughs> if I remember correctly it's never the place that you started uh it's going to be the place that you end up in your research yeah. Yeah. um there is a theme that has run throughout tonight through what you've both shared uh, that makes me think of this uh, idiom that I often think about with journalism, that when everyone is looking in one direction, a good reporter is looking in the opposite direction. Uh, and I really appreciate the way that uh, Tara with this book working to reveal and shine light on stories that hadn't been told before Tia with the kind of research that you're doing. Uh, hoping that tonight gives some inspiration and some knowledge that people can put to use as well. Um, thank you so much, Tara. Thank you so much, Tia. Really appreciate both your time and your expertise. Uh, and if you haven't picked up a copy of the book, uh, I've got the details that I just posted in the chat box and we'll have it in the Guild newsletter as well. Thanks everybody for joining tonight. Really appreciate it.